So, uh, welcome to the Better with, Better with Scattering workshop. Uh, thanks again to those who have joined us, both here and online. Uh, this is going to be the sort of main introduction to the uh, further course that we're doing. So, essentially, what we're going to, well, first I'm going to start with a disclaimer, essentially. Small angle siring is complex. There's lots of things going on. Um, and we will talk about this in a bit more detail. It also has many special cases, so it's not one size fits all. And this is the same as with many techniques. There's also different ways you can tackle uh, your analysis for small angle scattering. And the idea of uh, this talk is not to go into all these in detail. Uh, so this also is an ambiguous. Uh, essentially what you're getting from SACS is certain information, but a lot of the time you need other information from different sources <coughs> to actually uh, get the answers out of these things. So also the main bit of this talk is you're not going to become an expert from listening to this talk. There's again, it's complex, many special situations, and it's ambiguous. The idea of this talk is just to give you a more simplistic idea of how the technique works. And then later throughout the workshop, we can discuss uh, more in depth and talk about these things, uh, which is relevant more to specific samples that you have and all these other things. So essentially, I want you to work away with a basic knowledge of the technique and not think that this is going to be a advanced talk that you're going to know everything. There's still lots of little caveats that can go on in SACS. So let's talk about initially these ambiguities that I'm going on about. So from what can we get from SACS? Essentially, you can get three things from SACS. Uh, you can get the size of your, of your particles or whatever you're probing. You can get the shape, and you can get the packing. However, uh, these things all work together in your sample. However, what you can only get from SACS is one of these things. What you need to do is actually make assumptions or have other data on your samples that you are looking at so that you can get one of these out accurately. So a lot of the time you would use something like microscopy to look at the shape of your particles, which is the perfect technique to do that, looking at the shape. What SACS comes in really well is looking at your size distribution because you're looking at generally a lot more particles and uh, what you see in the SACS is everything that is in the beam. So if you're doing the, your experiments in flow and you've got particles in a solution, you're potentially probing all your sample whilst you're collecting this data. Whereas with microscopy, you can have some artifacts in your data from preparation and other things as well. So, but the other thing as well in SACS is it's very hard to actually mask what you're seeing. So if you have spheres and rods, you will see them both in your scattering pattern. It's impossible to deconvolute these things. So, but what you need to do is make assumptions or have other data of these two things, or of two of these, and then you can get the last one out. So this is a very important uh, point. So it's ambiguous, but if you do it right and team it up with other techniques, you can get very accurate information out about your samples that you're probing. So, look at this. So we also have what do I mean by small angle scattering is complex? So we can talk about equations. Um, however, the idea of this talk is not to talk about too many equations because one, it can be confusing and yeah, I want you to get a practical knowledge. So essentially, there's lots of equations that go with SACS and if you really want, after this talk, at some point we can discuss how the maths works for all these things. However, from the scope of this talk, I just want to keep it as simple as possible to make sure that you get a good idea of what is actually going on rather than a in-depth maths, physics point of view of this. So I think it's always better to have a working knowledge which is then backed up by your equations. However, for this talk, all I wanted you to have the idea is what small angle scattering is and just have a basic practical idea of it. So here is a very simplified equation from what uh, you, essentially the scattering equation. So this is made up of two parts mainly. So you have the form factor, which can give you information on the shape and size of your particles or what your sample you're probing. And you have the structure factor, which will give you other information on basically how these are packed together. So these are the two main fundamental things that you have to think about when you're looking at your small angle scattering data. So 
but this is simplified and make sure like I'm simplifying things as much as possible just to give you a general idea of how things work. However, we're going to try, well, before we get into the equations themselves and what they mean exactly, we're going to start looking at things from more of a practical point of view. So this is one of my samples. So here we have data from our machine. Um, it's very nice data, I like it a lot. Uh, but essentially, this is what you might get from SAC's small angle and wide angle scattering data. And you get a nice continuous curve where it all matches up. So what I'm gonna do is take you through this and give you an idea of what is actually going on within the sample to try and give you more of a practical explanation of what is going on here. So we're gonna focus on different regions of this scattering pattern. So we have down here, we have the wide angle scattering. Uh, so we'll focus on that for a little bit. We'll focus on the SACS region, but we'll also focus on some of the finer details of what is going on here. So we'll look at what is going on here uh, with the, using different uh, X-ray sources. We will have a look at why these things don't match up nicely. We'll also uh, look at what is going up on up here in the top and the low Q region. And also more importantly, we'll talk about what Q is because it might be an odd concept for people that are more used to different techniques. So here we have, this is a ZIF-8 sample. So essentially, uh, well, let's talk about scattering first. So this is how practically it works. You have your x-rays, you hit your sample with it, and then you get scatter. Uh, what you can do with this is, if we just roll this back a little, so what you can do is put detector and capture the scatter at the different distances. So if you have the detector close to your sample, this will catch the wide angle scattering. If you have it a bit further, and it may look like this for the sample that I've been showing you, so this is essentially uh, the diffraction that I'm getting off this sample. If we put, move the detector back, this gives, us, gives the small angles more uh, space to actually expand out, so you catch a different part of this system. So essentially all the scattering that is in here is now spread out over our detector. And then again, further back, you're getting even the smaller angles as you go, so everything is again spread out. This gives you the opportunity to probe your system and at different size regions so that you go from what is essentially lattice planes uh, to going through your particles. So to just give you an idea of this is, uh, this is what the despacing is uh, for our detector distances when we collected the data and turned it from these 2D images into our 1D images. So we should be able to probe roughly these sizes with each range that we have. So again, this is, very sim this is exactly the same as what I showed you with the hair platform. This is real data. So what we have is a beam stop, uh, which we had to use on our piece of paper as well. So again, how do we go from the two-dimensional data to the one-dimensional data? So what we do is exactly the same as what we did with the hair. So we have these green sections. These are uh, putting a mask on the data so that the, where we have a module separation. So our detector is made up of two modules and there's a gap in the middle. So in that gap, we're not actually collecting data. And then we have a beam stop, which is a arm that comes in front of the beam. So we also have to mask that out or else you're when you're integrating this pattern, you're going to get weird uh, zero values, essentially. So uh, again, a little video to show you how we do it. So because there's no orientation in this sample, because we're running it as a powder, as you, you can use your whole pattern this time. So from this uh, integration, this is the one-dimensional curve we get. So again, it's an intensity map. So on this side, this is essentially a density, and then we can have, in this example, it's pixels, so our detector is made up of pixels. So, but if you calibrate your machine, then you can turn these pixels into Q, two theta, or whatever values you want. So for SACS data, we mainly use Q. Uh, so essentially, from all these different images, if you do your integrations, you get different parts of your uh, SACS data, SACS and WAX data. So again, it's more thinking atomic spacings, lattice planes down at the wide angle, uh, which is high Q, and then we go move into sort of the nanoparticle regions as we go further away. So back to this. So what is actually scattering? So 
so when you're using x-rays, what you have to consider is uh, the electron density of what the atoms that you are probing. So this is one of the most important things in, uh, in the technique. So if you understand what is actually scattering your x-ray beam, then you can tailor your experiments to actually utilize and exploit this feature. So as you go through the periodic table, the electron density changes. So that means that certain atoms will scatter more than others. So in x-rays, hydrogen, deuterium doesn't scatter particularly well. But when you're looking at heavier atoms, then they scatter a lot more. If you're thinking about neutrons, it's you're sc scattering off nuclei rather than you are scattering off uh, the electrons. So something like hydrogen scatters a lot, lot more with the neutrons than it does with x-rays. However, for this, for this whole talk, we're going to focus on x-rays, uh, just because the data we've collected for you is x-ray scattering, and this is the instrument that we have access to. So how, essentially, how can we exploit this? So we. Uh, can see the difference in electron densities between our samples. However, this is a sort of a, a concept that is very important to all scattering. So what we see is we see a sample. If you have different things in that sample, then we may see the different things, but it all depends on what contrast, so the difference you have between the electron densities within your sample. So if I had these two things, so one is particles in an empty space and that went well. Uh, particles in an empty space and empty space within a membrane, they scatter the same. So this is a concept that is sometimes difficult to grasp, but what we're looking at, we're not probing the sample, like the particles in the sample. We're probing the difference of electron densities within the samples. So pores in the same configuration as particles, but instead of being an empty space and uh, being in a solid, these should scatter the same. So try and give you sort of a visual representation. So if we imagine down here is very low electron density and up here is very high density. And then we have a gray sample. So the sample has a similar electron density to this central location. So as we actually move this across, the sample electron density never changes. But as you get to the middle, it disappears. As you get to the low electron density, becomes much more visible. And as you go towards the other end of the spectrum where it's really uh, in, a, in a very high electron density, it becomes more visible as well. So it's about tailoring these things within your sample so that you can uh, exploit the technique as, as well as possible and see what you want to see. So here's another example. So what if we have two types of particles in a solution? So we've got these red ones and these blue ones. So then what we can do is actually change the solution, the electron density of the solution that it is in. So as we actually change the electron density of the solvent that we're in, what you actually see is you start to lose one set of your particles. So in SACS, instead of seeing this two, these two particles in the system, we start to see just these one. So this is very important to think about when you have multiple things in your system, or even if you just have one type of particles and one solvent. If the, con if the electron densities of those match, then you're not going to be able to see anything. However, so this is, um, so in your sites you just see this. So what if we go to, say, a core shell system, and then again we put these in some solutions. So the same sample in two different solutions could give us two different answers. So essentially, what we would see if we had the solvents that I just showed, we would see core shell particles in the sacs, and we would see the spherical particles in the sacs, depending on how your solvents, electron density, and contrast in your system matches to these things. So this is after doing background subtractions uh, on your data. So uh, essentially, I'm not going to go into background subtractions too much, because we have a talk or tomorrow about that will cover this in much more detail. But essentially, if you take a scattering pattern of this and then a scattering pattern of your solvent, you can remove the solvent from your solution, and then you are left, in theory, with just your particles. So this is exactly the same if you're looking at solid samples. So say you had this membrane, and then you had some particles in there, and you also had some particles in the pore. If you can also give a blank membrane that is the same as this membrane, you can remove it and just be left with your particles.
So, however, there's lots of things to think about with this. And this is a somewhat scary looking table, but it will all be go through uh, tomorrow by Brian. Um, essentially, there's lots of things to do with it, but just want to give you the idea of how background subtractions work rather than the in-depth, which will come tomorrow. So, back to this data. Um, is everything okay? May as well check. Yep. Okay, so from here back to this data. So we're going to look at the wax region first. Uh, this is the uh, this is if eight essentially. So uh, it's a crystalline material. Um, this is its uh, unit, cell. unit cell. Yes. So in this unit cell, you have lots of characteristic distances, and this is some XRD data from it. So diffraction data, a lot of you will be more fam familiar with it than, say, small angle scattering and wide angle scattering. So what we have, you can index the planes that you have, which are essentially just the distances, the periodic distances that you have within this unit cell. So this is the wax data we get from it. And so here we have XRD data and we have wax data. Uh, the difference is this. One is in two theta and one is in Q. So the data is essentially identical apart from what sort of uh, axis you have these on. So it's important to actually understand the differences between these axes. So when you're talking two theta, well, essentially when we're looking at a unit cell within a material, it has a despacing. That is not gonna change no matter what X-ray, well, with the X-rays you throw at it and collect your data, the despacing of your material is not going to change. So for this, uh, two theta is actually uh, relevant to your wavelength, whereas D to Q is not. So this becomes more apparent when we actually start talking about the next bit. Oh, but first we'll actually see where Q and T theta actually come from. So we have our x-rays and we have our sample and it's uh, at a certain wavelength. So as you hit your sample, you get scatter and then there's a certain angle. This angle is two theta. So this is what measured in your XRD patterns. And then, so, if you have, you can get theta obviously about this, half the angle, but this is what Q is. So Q is a vector, essentially. It's the, called the scattering vector. It has a couple other names, but for this, we'll just call it the scattering vector. So this is the difference between your incident uh, vector and your final vector. So instead of measuring this angle, we're measuring this vector instead. So this is essentially the main difference between when you're looking at diffraction data and how it is normally shown from XRD machines to Sachs wax data. You will probably always see the data in Q rather than two theta. So how does this actually affect things? So what you actually have, so we have these despacings that are periodic without, throughout this structure. So what happens when you use a different wavelength of X-rays? So here we have copper radiation, and here we have molybdenum radiation. The sample and everything is all in the same position within the machine. All we are doing is changing the wavelength. So what we see is when we're using a copper radiation compared to a molybdenum radiation, it's essentially, your, it scatters at a different angle. So this two theta changes with your wavelength. However, how this is, more important when you're looking at X-ray diffraction data because you're in two theta. So you would have molybdenum scattering at a lower angle for the same peaks as where the copper would scatter. When you look at Sachs wax data, it all lines up because you're not actually dependent on this angle. You're looking at the vector instead. So when you're comparing XRD patterns, you need to know what source of X-rays you are using. Once you have your Sachs data in one dimension, then the sources don't matter as much because you've already corrected for that with Q. So this can sometimes simplify things a little, uh, a little way. Uh, this is something made by Brian, the nonogram. So this essentially shows you how to, uh, I've clicked accidentally, how to get from uh, D to Q, which is nicely in line with each other. However, if you want to get from two theta to D, 
what you have to do is find out where your value in two theta is, then find your energy, and then you can put a ruler between here and your energy, and then you can work out what your d is. Whereas this is a much easier calculation of just 2 pi over q equals d. So there is some simplifications of having your data in q than in 2 theta. So we've now covered these two things quite quickly. The next thing to cover, and well, we've also talked about this. So from this uh, uh, data, what we see is uh, we see the molybdenum uh, part of our data. We see the copper part of our data up here. But all this purple section is the overlap that we have when we use both sources. So when we use the molybdenum source, we can get a little higher Q. When we use the copper source, we can get a little lower Q. Uh, this is very useful depending on the sizes that uh, are based in your sample. Uh, but we get a lot of overlap as well, which is also extremely useful. So now I think, well, essentially what you would expect from molybdenum and copper is them to line up nicely. So it's probably a good idea to actually talk about what is actually happening in this section. Uh, so it's again a bit of an odd concept for some. So what we actually have is fluorescence going on. So when you put, uh, hit your sample with x-rays that are of a certain energy, if that energy is close to the, uh, the emission absorption edge, emission edge, uh, absorption edge, yeah. Uh, basically, when your x-rays come in, it can excite an electron within the sample. This electron can then be ejected or go to a higher state. And then what you are left with is a hole that needs to be filled. So this hole can be filled by electrons in a higher energy state. And that will go into this state. This actually causes a loss in energy for this. So you have this as an X-ray fluorescence come off. This is then is collected by your detector and leaves you with a background level. So for what we have here is the peaks match up nicely in Q and uh, essentially what we have here is a flat background level from this fluorescence. So this is an important concept as well for making sure that you are using the correct energy of x-rays for the sample you are probing. Uh, so essentially you can tailor, well, if you go to a synchrotron where they can change the wavelength quite easily, you can make sure that you are not near this absorption edge so that you um, are able to uh, negate this, these sorts of effects. This also can be used in other types of scattering methods uh, that utilize this uh, absorption. However, they're quite complex and not really in the scope of this introduction. So let's go back to some equations. So essentially, the scattering pattern that you uh, have from doing your experiments is made up of the form factor and the structure factor. Form factor, shape and size, essentially. Structure factor is how everything is packed together within your sample. This is also very dependent on what size range you are looking at in your sample. So we're going to have a bit of a focus on the structure factor to start with. So a simple concept is if you are in a dilute system, you can assume that the packing is, your particles are very far apart. So this makes the structure factor go to one. So then once you're left with your pattern, you have your form factor times your structure factor. This kind of makes things easier and means that Sachs is very good at looking at dilute systems or systems with very large spacings between the actual particles. Um, when you've got a densely packed, uh, cis, uh, packed sample, so say you're looking at a powder or a concentrated solution, this is where your structure factor is going to start playing quite a lot of uh, part in your uh, overall scattering pattern that you end up with. So first wall of text. So essentially, structure factor in crystallography is your lattice factor. Essentially, the only difference is when you're thinking SACS to crystallography and diffraction is that instead of thinking of atoms that you are in crystallography, you're thinking of particles instead. So you can get the exact same, fa uh, exact same effects from the scattering of these particles when they're nicely ordered in a system as you can from atoms ordered in a system. You just see it in a different size range. So essentially, again, densely packed systems, and it looks, the structure factor give, gives you information on the interparticle distances. Interparticle, interatom, it's all the same. It's just going to happen in a different size range along your data. 
So this gives you signal, uh, interparticle distances of a similar magnitude to the distances within the particles themselves. Uh, there are continuous uh, contributions from the neighboring particles in the scattering pattern. So because you're not just looking at this single particle where you, once you've scattered off this, you also have interactions from the other particles surrounding it. So then you have all of this adding up uh, to, into your scattering pattern. So from this is you can form bright peaks or peaks in your data. Uh, exactly the same as you do from scattering of atoms in a periodic lattice. You can get this in different size ranges in your SACS data as well. Um, so essentially what you also see is a lot towards lower Q. Uh, you can see what sort of interactions your particles are having as well. Uh, so if you see a decrease in the intensity, it generally means you might have some repulsion between your particles. If you see an increase, you probably have an, att an attraction. However, you could also have aggregates, and we'll talk about this a little more uh, after this bit. So peaks can form in your sample. So we have, in this one, we have our atoms scattering in this periodic lattice, and we have these nice broad peaks. What if we had something like this, though? So this is a hexagonal lattice, roughly drawn by hand. <laughs> Uh, so it's a lattice of pores and membranes. So it's periodically spaced and it's a hexagonal lattice. So what I would expect is from a hexagonal unit cell is the exact same system as I would when I'm scattering off these pores. However, these are 120 nanometers apart. So not in the same region as you would think of X-ray diffraction. But you get the same thing going on as you do. So if we click this on the detector, this isn't this poorly drawn sample. This is a real sample <laughs> that has a similar system to this. So we collect the data, and then what we get is a hexagonal lattice, uh, just at a completely different size range as what we would expect from our diffraction. So you can do exactly as you would with a hexagonal lattice normally, and you can index all these peaks. But these all correspond to the unit cell that you have in this hexagonal lattice. So no matter where you have a hexagonal lattice or any lattice, if you have this periodic structure, whether it's made up of atoms or made up of particles, if you're in the correct probing in the correct size range, you are going to see that in your data. So so spit, and then what we have back to the data. So this sample obviously doesn't have a periodic lattice because it doesn't. Well, it does in its atoms form, but not when the particles are packed together. So this sample was run as a powder. So you take all your little particles, pack them together, and we put some little bits of sticky tape on both sides, and then we collect the data. So this, we can assume the packing of it is pretty densely packed uh, because we're in a powder. So we covered what the brag, in, brag peaks are going there. However, is, if we talk about this interference, uh, that is happening with the amplitudes at low Q. So this is what we have over here. This can mean one of two things. So what we have is we see, uh, oh, that's the wrong button. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, over here, we see an increase in the intensity. This can tell us be one of two things. This could tell us that because we're running in a packed powder, all of them, are nicely tightly packed together. So uh, what we have here is we don't have this decrease of repulsion, we have this attraction. However, what it could also be is aggregates. So because we can make the assumption that this is packed together, we may be able to think about that it might not be aggregates. However, if we had something larger in here, so if we had all these particles packed together and they were forming aggregates, they'd be of a much larger size. So instead of scattering the region that we're looking at, they would scatter at a much lower Q region. So the problem with this is that this tells us one of two things. However, with SACS, we don't have a way of proving this. So this is where we get into the ambiguities as well. I can assume from the triangle that I showed you earlier that we have a packed powder and that I know the shape of them, and then I can get the size out. However, Assuming this is a packed powder, it is a packed powder. However, assuming there's no aggregates in there is probably not the most correct thing you can do because that would scatter over here somewhere in a region that isn't covered by small angle scattering. It's more uh, ultra small angle scattering. So the thing is you need something else to prove this 
this uh, hypothesis you could have between these two things. So essentially, we covered this bit so far. So now we're going to go into the rest of the Sachs region. So this is where we start talking about some form factor. So essentially, shape and size will, uh, form factor covers the shape and size of the scattering that you have. So what is, is an interference pattern of the scattered waves from within a particle. So uh, this is characteristic of the shape of the particles, and which means essentially, depending on the shape of your particles, if they're spheres, they will scatter in a certain way. If they are rods, they will scatter in a slightly different way. And these are concepts to consider when you're actually looking at your data. So uh, in, when you're in a dilute solution, as I mentioned before, the structure factor goes to one. So you can essentially ignore the structure factor and essentially you're just probing the form factor of your sample. So here's some examples of spherical uh, form factors uh, from models. So this is all the same, uh, the same simulation. However, what I've done is put a background on them. So a lot of the time, if you have particles this size, you're not going to see all of this because there's backgrounds to consider, instrumental backgrounds, which are going to push your level up. So even though these are all the same simulated model, they've got different backgrounds on them. So this is why they look different. So this can also be a little confusing because you think you have perfect spheres that are all the perfect same size, and it doesn't look like this. It might not look like that because real life has backgrounds. So it's always something to consider, and this is just to show you that this data may look like this data, so there's also some ambiguities in there. So here we have a 10 nanometer particle. Uh, I've gone with the higher background as well, just to, uh, so that everything isn't nicely, looks like a perfect sphere. So what if you have slightly larger particles? They move towards lower Q. So again, big things, small things. So big things, small Q, uh, high Q is smaller things. So think atomic distances, thinking hundreds of nanometers and everything in between. So as you get to larger particles, your curve is going to shift towards this low Q region. So it will keep shifting and because all these are spheres, all the form factors are exactly the same apart from it shifted. And then the distances between the maximas are different as well and they all correspond to the shape and size of the particle that you are probing. So I've just stacked them so you can get a, just a better idea of where they actually lie in Q. Um, so what if you're not looking at spheres? What if you're looking at a cylinder or ellipsoid? So we've just shown you how the form factor can be affected by size by moving across where you're actually probing in Q. Uh, so if you're thinking of different shapes, what you get is different shaped curves. So again, these are stacked just to show you them separately. But here we have a sphere, and then we have a cylinder, and then we have an ellipsoid. So we see different things in the scattering which correspond to different parts of these shapes. And there's lots of mathematical, mathematical models to actually describe these shapes. But as I said before, we're not going to go too deep into the maths at all of how this works. However, what you see is different bumps compared, which correspond to different distances within your system. So when you've got a sphere, you just have this nice uh, mice uh, bump, essentially, and then it tails off to flat. Here, what we have is sort of a bump here and a here. This will give you your corresponding distances for the distances that are in your cylinder. So I know that I modeled a 10 nanometer radius with a, I think, 100 nanometer length. So this is why we have these two bumps here. This again is the same essential thing as well, apart from you're looking at a ellipsoid instead of a cylinder. Uh, so let's go back to this data. So we're going to focus on this region of the curve. Um, and so then we're going to start trying to work out what the size of these things are. So again, from what we did with the hair, uh, we can do the exact same calculation to give us a rough guess of what is going on here. So it comes out around 35 nanometers. So it's probably not a terrible, terrible place to start. So this is a simulation of a, a 35 nanometer sphere. Uh, I put a background level on there. 
and then I've also given it a little polydispersity. So that means that instead of all the particles in the simulation being perfectly spherical and perfectly 35 nanometers, this will give you a slight distribution, a Gaussian distribution of 1% with the sizes that you are probing. So this is what it will look like. So instead of it just being a single population of 35 nanometer spheres, I've given a little polydispersity, so there's some discrepancy between these, uh, the sizes within these things. So, um, but it doesn't match up perfectly. So what if we throw together some smaller particles and some bigger ones, and then maybe some smaller ones and some bigger ones, and like it spreads out this depending on where it is, but this is just to give you an idea of how the size changes with your form factor. So what if we start summing these things together though? So what if we decide we have some 35 nanometer particles? And then we want to add some 34 nanometer particles. And then we want to add a bit more, one nanometer each side. And then what we see is the pattern change. And you see a lot of change in this region uh, with the depths of these things. However, when you're doing it this way, this looks a bit odd. So this is all just summing together one nanometer particle ranges and summing them all together. So you get a little odd. But if we start doing something a bit more realistic in this, rather than just subbing 35, 36, 37 nanometer particles together, what we can do is do a broader distribution of these particles. So we'll start off again with the 1% polydispersity, and then we can move on to uh, 2%. Then we have some 5%, and then we have 10%. So we're getting much closer to what this actually looks like. So, and then if we go a little further to 15%, again, it's getting smoothed out quite a lot. This is a very important concept to think about real samples. Not all real samples are really nice spheres. So you're not gonna see these sharp drops. I've seen some samples in real life that do have these nice sharp drops, but not as sharp as some of the models that you will see. Sadly, it's the real world and making perfectly sized particles of all the same size and all the same shape doesn't really happen. So you're always gonna have this bit of polydispersity. And the easiest way of seeing that is where, what is happening to these minimas. If you have something that is really, really polydispersed, you're gonna lose these minimas and you're gonna be left with this bump. Uh, so this is when you've got lots more polydispersity, which happens a lot of the time, but you can still get things out of your data, even if you just have that. It's just a case of using the right models and cutting down those ab ambiguities so that you can get to the right answer. So this is just them on top of each other so you just get a better representation of what is happening. So 1% all the way up to 15% polydispersity. And this is the broadest to the sharpest. So just to get the concept over to you. So how do we actually start fitting this data like in real world? Um, so you've got to consider the form factor and the structure factor. I've run this in a powder and so I know that there's definitely going to be structure factor in my data and I've shown you where it is. Um, but this is the thing to consider. From Sachs, it has an ambiguity. I know the shape of these particles. I roughly know how they're packing. And if I get microscopy, I can know these very accurately if I have aggregates and things like this. Uh, and then what I want, the most interesting bit out of this sample is I want to know the size distribution. So because I just want to know that one thing, and if I have the other information, then I can get there. Problem is, with this sample, so, well, with this sample, I know the packing. I'm running it in a powder, and if I get microscopy, I know the size, and if I have aggregates. That cancels these two things out. But this is the actual shape of these particles, well, roughly speaking, from a mathematical sense. So the problem is, using a spherical model, isn't going to work, especially when it's all packed together in a powder. Uh, so this is where you need to look at other models. So this is going to link in with Brian's talk on Thursday as well, where you can, there is lots of models available and easily accessible. More complex models need more complex analysis a lot of the time. So it's a case of doing 
the right thing for your sample. And you need to know the prior information of your sample to be able to get the most out of your data and be confident of what you are getting out of it. So essentially, that is one of the main concepts is that you need other information to get the most out of your data. Uh, and no matter which one you want to get out, you can get these out as long as you have the other information. But it's a case of knowing these principles. So this was a quick introduction to SACS. Like, uh, it's not here, but there's many things I have missed. So backgrounds are covered tomorrow. Uh, there'll be one and a half talks roughly on backgrounds and how to process data and these things. I haven't talked about smearing. Uh, there's many ways this can come up, and it's just one thing to think about um, and is very dependent on your setup of how these are done. But when we're going through your data, we'll be able to show you some examples of this as well. Uh, broadening. Broadening can be from multiple different things. So if you've got your diffraction, then you may have peak broadening. You can generally have it from the sample itself, but you can also have it from your instrumental setup. So this is also something to consider as well when you're doing analysis of different types as well. Um, it's important to understand that your instrument has this broadening in there and be able to calculate that accurately. So then you can work out the broadening from your sample, which is actually to do with your sample rather than just uh, being something that is from the instrument. Uh, orientation I haven't covered either. Uh, so when you're looking at 2D images uh, you, and you have an orientated system, this will show up in your 2D data. Um, we have different types of fitting. We've got all of Wednesday, which will cover three different software packages. This will give you a much idea, better idea of how to fit data. However, there's many, many more ways of doing it, and maybe a day isn't long enough. However, for the scope of this workshop and your data, we'll get you there. Um, absolute intensity I also haven't covered because there will be another talk on this again tomorrow from Brian. Um, but there are many other things that I've also missed even off this list. Uh, but that kind of brings me back to this. There's many special cases. And the idea of this talk isn't to actually make you an expert. It's just to give you a general idea of the general principles that are actually going on within the data you're looking at. But remember, many special cases, even with the samples that we've received from everyone here and online, there are many special cases. But we will go through them with you individually. And it's best to, when you're looking at SACS data, remember that there are ambiguities and that you need information on your sample. And then you can get the most out of your SACS data. So it's just something to remember. So essentially, thank you for listening.